All right, family, we should be live. As always, let me know in the chat that you can hear us so we can know things are working good. Give us a thumbs up. Um, it is great to be here with you guys tonight to fellowship with the body of Christ. And it's wonderful to have my brother Pete Garcia on with me again tonight. How are you doing, brother? I'm good, man. Really good. Dude, it's great to have you um, back on again and to thank you guys. I see the thumbs up to talk about some exciting stuff. I mean, our number one favorite subject, Jesus. We're going to talk about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And that's who we seek uh, above all else to point to. So guys, if, if any of you don't know uh, Pete Garcia, I highly, highly recommend you check out his website, which is rev310.net. That's like R-E-V for revelation, rev310.net. That's where Pete posts his blogs. And uh, tonight is a part two uh, of, of a video that Pete and I have already done uh, prior to this, which is called uh, rapture, the final four, question mark. So this is Rapture, the final four, part two. And I highly encourage you, if you're watching this later, if you haven't watched part one, to go go watch it. Uh, but right now we're live. It's Friday, March 31st. And Pete and I are live together. And I want to make something uh, clear before we go further. Tonight uh, is like a co teaching deal. I mean, this is what Pete and I love to do. So it, it, some people will get confused and think like um, we're just doing an interview here or something. But Pete has some stuff that he wants to share and talk about. And I have stuff that I want to share and talk about. So we're going to bounce back and forth and tag team and co-teach. That's what we're doing tonight. Um, also want to make this clear as we did in the last video, uh, we are not making any predictions here whatsoever. Uh, we don't know when the rapture is going to happen. I want to say that again. We do not know or claim to know when the rapture is going to happen. However, we are going to have a reasonable and logical thinking out loud discussion tonight about some very exciting things. Um, so, Pete, do you have anything to add to that before we start getting into the topic tonight? Uh, yeah, just, you know, as, as Christians, uh, well, I think a lot of Christians, we often kind of get uh, sucked into this denominational, um, you know, um, uh, steady state, if you will, status quo of just going to church, um, trying to do you know, live moral lives and be decent people. And, and I, and I think that all of those things are fine, but when we take a step back and look at what are we really doing and what are we really believing this world that we're in now is not going to continue on forever. It, it has an expiration date and the Bible says it has an expiration date. Well, we don't know what that expiration date is. It does tell us things that we can look for to let us know that that time is near. And there's an abundance of uh, trends and signs and typologies and um, things that scripture is chock full of, of evidences and, um, you know, just uh, things to bolster our faith. And, you know, Jesus often told his disciples things ahead of time and he kind of prefaced it with like, I'm telling you this ahead of time so that when it happens, you'll believe. And so, you know, Jesus chastised the Pharisees because they didn't recognize the season that the that of the of the Messiah. He wept over the city of Jerusalem because they didn't recognize the sign of his coming. There's no point in any part of the Bible where God disciplines or get ang get, gets angry at his believers for being eager for him <laughs> to show up. You know, um, it's all about. He's chastising and rebuking those who aren't paying attention, who aren't watching and waiting for his return. So I think for those of us that are here tonight and for those of us, if you're watching this after the fact, um, that you're longing for the Lord's return, you're longing for the rapture. 
um, that's a good thing. That's, you know, like, a, like good children waiting on their, on their father to, to arrive. You know, that's, 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 you know, if I go away on a long trip and I come home and my kids are there, they're super excited to see me. They've been waiting there for me. They've been counting down the days. They've got a calendar going. I'm not going to go home and scream at them for that. Right. No, no, that's what I want them to do. You know, I want them to be excited for my return. And right. Jesus wants to come back and he can't wait to come back and be with us and to be all reunited as one giant family. So uh, this is part of what this is. And, uh, you know, Tyler, you said this a while back, you know, you just told me like, man, this is how I'm wired and that's how I'm wired, you know, and, and I, and I love prophecy. And the, the beautiful thing about prophecy is how it ties in with the rest of scripture beautifully. It's not just in the book of revelation. It's scattered throughout the entire Bible, old Testament and new Testament from, the beginning of Genesis all the way to the last page of Revelation 22. So it, it's it's something that God intended for us to know. And he armed a, He arms us with this so that we would have this knowledge ahead of time. So uh, I'll hand it back to you, Tyler, and uh, let's go. Yeah. Amen to everything you said, brother. Um, so, okay, guys, I'm going to, I'm going to pull up, we're going to get right into it. So, I'm going to pull up a simple kind of elementary chart that I made kind of covering this final four concept, uh, this 2000 year period concept. And I'm going to walk through it with you guys. And uh, we're just going to talk about some things and kind of lay a foundation. And then I'm going to we're going to get into more biblical typological evidence from scripture that bolsters this perspective and makes this perspective more exciting and deeper. So that's kind of the purpose for tonight. Our, our previous video, I think we, we covered a lot. Tonight is a, a um, bolstering of that first video with even more biblical, exciting evidence. Um, but let me share this chart with you guys. So I made this chart and it's very simple and boiled down. I wanted to make something that was just, you know, anyone could wrap their head around. And this is kind of the concept of the final four. Uh, that's where we get the title, the final, final four. That actually comes from uh, an article that Gary wrote at unsealed.org, which I highly recommend. I highly recommend you go read that article on unsealed.org. So I got that's where I got the title from. I asked Gary for his permission, and he said yes to use that term, Final Four. So as you can see here, I will have possible timeline at the top. So again, I, we're not saying thus says the Lord. We're not making predictions here. This is this is me looking at scripture and trying to work things out using region, reason and logic. But you can see the cross right there at the far left hand side says 30 AD or 33 AD. So according to most scholars, uh, everyone who really studies this, when was the crucifixion? It's somewhere in the 30 to 33 AD window. That's It happened somewhere around there. Uh, Pete, I believe you lean towards 33 AD and your, your friend uh, Randy Nettles, uh, which uh, tons of awesome biblical scholars lean towards that. I lean more towards uh, 30 AD myself for when the crucifixion date was. And there's reasons for that. We're not going to get into all that. That's not the point. The point is it was somewhere, according to pretty much everyone's uh, study, it was somewhere in 30 to 33 AD. So then... 2,000 years forward in time, as you can see there in the green from the cross, brings you to either 2030, 2031, 2032, or 2033. Okay? That would be when we would expect the second coming to happen, which is at the end of the tribulation period. The second coming is when Jesus comes and he puts a stop to Satan in his Antichrist kingdom, and he, and he sets up the, his millennial kingdom, Jesus' millennial reign, this 1,000-year kingdom. That's the second coming. So if you back up seven years 
before the second coming. And again, remember, the second coming is at the end of the seven year tribulation period. That's why we look seven years before that date range. That gives you a window, and I have it labeled rapture zone. I used to call it the rapture window when I, I did a video about this kind of concept a few years ago. That there's this 2023, 2024, 2025, or 2026. And it depends on, again, this all depends on this, whenever the, the crucifixion was, it, it's a window of time. So it would be possible and reasonable to look at this rapture zone as a high watch, exciting window of time. And I all for, for the rapture to occur in somewhere in that time. So I've also labeled the fig tree generation on this chart, which I think is very, very big, uh, a very, very big point to make. It's a very important biblical typological thing to be aware of and to look at. And it shows that Israel, the, which is the fig tree, bloomed in 1948, that became a nation again in 1948. And so from the time that Israel became a nation again, the final generation, the fig tree generation clock started ticking. And it goes from the point that Israel became a nation again, all the way to the second coming at the end of the tribulation period. That is the fig tree generation. And the point basically being that someone who was alive at the moment Israel became a nation again will be alive at the second coming. It's a That's what we mean by generation, the length of a human's life, which generally is around 70 to 80 years if you look at the statistics now online. So this is a simple breakdown of the final four concept. And that final four would be specifically that rapture zone that you see there in blue. So I want to make it very clear that Pete and I are not saying the rapture absolutely will happen somewhere in that window of time. And we're also saying it can't happen until uh, 2026, because some people got confused for some reason on our last video about that. The point is, anytime from 2023, 2024, 2025, or 2026, I would consider a very interesting time to be looking for the rapture. I'm very interested in that zone of time. And this is very logical to go 2,000 years from the date of the cross then rewind seven years from that date range, it gives you a final four window of time. So that's kind of the synopsis, the simple synopsis. Um, I'll kick it back to you, Pete, if you want to talk about this as well. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm, I really like this. I think this is the first time I've seen it um, kind of fully done. Um, I, like the, I like the simplicity of it. I, you know, I think people last time were a little, um, nah, not everybody, but there were some cer certain folks that were confused as if we were saying it was going to, you know, that right. 2033 was the the year. And, and what we were trying to say then and what we'll say again now is it just that's the latest that we are looking at right now for all of these things to, kind of, you know, kind of take place. So okay. it could very well be, um, you know, um, that uh, 2030 is the midpoint, you know, it, it could very well be that, you know, we don't know. Um, but if we're looking at it from today, we're looking, basically we're in this 10 year window right now. So it's 2023, we're gonna look out 2033 at the latest. And um, I just want folks to make sure that, you know, people don't get hung up on 2030 as, you know, everything having to be done by then. I kind of, uh, you know, I we look at, <clears throat> We look at things in the Old Testament, we look at the typology, we look at history, we look at the fact that, you know, uh, you know, from Adam to Abraham was 2000 years from Abraham to Christ was 2000 years to from his to his first coming. And now we're coming up uh, very closely and very rapidly to his the window of his, his second coming. So um, these are just, you know, we're just theorizing right now. We're looking at it, you know, based off of history. 
um, looking at the past, this, this seems like a very likely window to be in. And um, I just, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want there to be any confusion. We're not saying that it has to be 2033. We're just saying that's the latest that we're kind of projecting out right now. And so um, <clears throat> I've got uh, just a couple of notes. I don't know. I don't want to jump all over where you're going. So um, if I was just going to look simply at um, some things that need to take place prior to the start of the tribulation. So I don't know if you want me to go there yeah, or wait. Go, go ahead. Bring it up. And and then um, I, I just wanted to, to say one more thing, though, like th this... Uh, this is a very simple way of, of us looking at this, right? Like we're, I think what you and I are trying to present with this final four concept and trying to help people understand is that it's a very like non-sensational, very reasonable thing. It's something that a, a lot of people can really easily wrap their minds around and understand, okay, this is, I mean, it's just pretty factual based. Like we're going 2000 years from where the cross happened, 3080 to 3380, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> you know that um, if, 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 and this is a big if, if we're saying that 2033 is the latest and we backed it up seven years, we have to factor in at least one major thing that's got to take place. And that is the, the burning of the weapons uh, shortly after the Gog and Magog war where, um, you know, the, the Russia, Turkey, Iran um, confederation comes against Israel. Um, God destroys them supernaturally. I see that as a, I see that as an event that happens after the rapture or maybe because of the rapture, the world's thrown into chaos and they decide to take advantage of that situation of the chaos. Um, but there still needs to be that they're burning weapons for seven years. Right. And I believe that's in Ezekiel 39 mm -hmm. and they can't, you know, we know at the midpoint of the tribulation that they are going to be on the run for the, for their lives. So to me, that means that, there needs to be a point seven years prior to the midpoint for that to be um, uh, to come to pass. And so that's why I've always kind of looked at three and a half years as kind of a window between the rapture and the official start of the 70th week, um, which is if that's the case. Um, you know, either way, that doesn't necessarily impact this this window that we're looking at, but. Um, that's just one of the things we know that there are some other things that need to take place. The, um, coming together of the, the beast kingdom and whether that's the 10 regions and maybe those are cities that are, that are here now and are, what do they call them? Um, megalopolises, you know, these big urban sprawls, uh, you know, like if you look at from say Washington DC all the way up to, to, to Boston, that would be a, a megalopolis. Um, and there's places all over the world. There's, you know, probably about a dozen of them. And if these end up becoming these headquarters for the, the, you know, the 10 of them become these regional headquarters for the beast kingdom, there's still going to be some logistics in that, in that transition to get those, you know, we're going to go from 193 nations to 10 regions. <laughs> That's not going to happen overnight. I mean, that, that does take time. Um, you know, when I was in the army, we transitioned from one command to another. And I, I was within the army within one branch of the military, we're just transitioning, we're picking up a, a center of excellence from one command to another. And that was still a huge process to move all that over. People, departments, restructuring, resizing. I mean, it's just, we're looking at going from 193 nations as the way the world is today to bringing that in, in into and under 10 regions. So that, that does speak to um, some time there has to be some time built into that how much time hard to say i think you know like i've said on numerous times that that the rapture right now or the restrainer restraining everything in place it's not just restraining wickedness it's restraining technology it's restraining geopolitical um, ambitions and all kinds of things that that are going to be kept in place kind of just just hovering there until the rapture happens and then once that happens 
happens, the shoe falls and everything can kind of just move forward in, in like a flood. So I think things can happen very quickly after that. So I think this is a very good window of time, this 10 years that we're in. We all we have to do today, turn on the news, <laughs> read the read online, read the news online. You've got nations racing towards creating a, a central bank digital currency. You've got nations racing to go to some kind of a global governance. You've got the United States, which have been the world's superpower for the last 75 years, is quickly faltering and stumbling and quickly becoming um, a shadow of its former self. You've got nations that are hostile to the American way of life rising up around the world, Russia, China. You've got other nations that are vying for power. Um, there's, a, there's a shift in the wind today. There's a shift in, in the global wind and the, the days of American dominance is over. And whatever happens after the rapture, I think the rapture will be that catalyst that, that triggers all that. But um, the U.S. won't look, you know, the U.S. will still be on the map and they'll still be a Washington, D.C. and so forth. But they are no longer going to be called the United States of America. It will just become a region, one of the 10 regions of the, of the beast kingdom. So there's, I just want people to think through some of this stuff that, that you know, let's just say the rapture happened today. The beast kingdom is not going to be fully running tomorrow there is time that has to be built into this so i think a 10-year window that we're looking at right now uh, the four the four-year window for really for the rapture of the church but the 10-year window for all of this stuff to kind of take place still fits very nicely in it and it still it makes everything um seem very plausible in my mind some people are saying that uh pete's microphone is very crackly and I hear the same thing on my end, guys. He's on a hotel Wi-Fi, and I think that's just how it is, guys. We're just going to have to roll with it. Um, you're going to have to just do your best. I can understand you just fine. Yeah. It's just crackly. Let me, let me log out, and I'll log back in real quick. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, guys, Pete's, Pete's at a hotel, and the Wi-Fi, I, and I've tried it before as well. I mean, the Wi-Fi is really hard to stream from. Uh, when you're at a hotel, it, it's not the greatest. And so he's probably having having some buffering issues and things like that. So he'll sign out here and then sign back in. And hopefully it might get better. If it doesn't, it's no big deal. We're going to have to, I see a lot of you guys saying that it was okay for you. And I can understand him pretty well uh, too, but I just want to make sure that you guys know it may not get better and we're just going to have to roll with it. But as soon as Pete gets back, I'm going to comment on a couple things that he was bringing up there uh, because we have a slightly different perspective, which is which is cool. I like showing two perspectives. Right, we got you back. So, Pete, I was going to actually, actually comment on a couple things. And I'm hearing my voice on your on your microphone, so I don't know if you have your headphones working or maybe you need to mute your microphone. Talk. I'm not sure. But um, yeah. I was going to comment on a couple things. First, the the seven seven years of burning weapons. You know, there's several different views on that, um, and I like this that you and I have some different perspectives on things because it's it's cool to to show different sides of um of or different ways of looking at things. I actually think that the seven years of burning weapons uh, could easily be the seven year tribulation period. Personally, um, I think that it, it talks about how, you know, people in Israel will be burning weapons or those weapons will be burned for seven years. I don't think that uh, Israel or, or the whatever governmental authority that's over that region, which is burning those things. I don't think that all ceases to be during the tribulation period or during the final half of the tribulation period. I think they could still be burning weapons while the remnant of jews who are listening to god and haven't taken the mark of the beast because obviously there will be i think if you take the mark of the beast uh the remnant goes and hides in the wilderness where god has a place prepared for them i'm hearing my voice again yeah, I'm, on your mic i'm uh i am not super wedded to 
uh, any one position when it comes to things happening immediately after the rapture, especially especially within that gap period of time, because um, it's too hard to 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 you know it's not anything yeah. I'm going to plant my flag on that hill and and die on that hill for it, you know because we don't know how that's exactly going to play out. Uh, a friend of mine asked about uh, you know the Euphrates River drying up. And he was asking the question, um, you know, what about the Tigris River? <laughs> you know, because there's two rivers there, right? So it only mentions the one river. And then, uh, you know, and he was asking about, uh, you know, well, why would that even be an issue for an army anyways? Because, you know, armies can, we have bridging, uh, river bridging capabilities and all that. That's That's been a technology that's been around for 100 years. Yeah. And so I just said, hey, you know, it, 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 it's, we don't know what's going to happen in terms of the judgments. The judgments could terraform all of Iraq. I mean, uh, an earthquake could take out the dam there and, and, and Turkey and completely flood the Shinar Valley there. And it could just turn into one giant river. I mean, there's a whole host of things that could happen between now and then, especially within the 70th week itself um, that, that we just can't see. We can't, we can't, we're looking at it now. We're like, how how is that working, or how does that become an issue? But got, the Bible says it's going to be an issue, and He's going to have to dry that that river up in order for those armies from the east to cross it. So apparently, something happens that that really transforms the center of Iraq, and apparently floods it uh, very badly. So that that had God not dried it up, those nation those nations wouldn't be able to cross it. So. I just use as an example, um, you know, I, I kind of see three and a half years as a gap. And, that, and during that time, the, the Jews are burning the weapon and then that goes into the first half of the tribulation. But, you know, you and I, we're going to be watching this from the, from right. the mezzanine. So, right. So, um, so the point is, you know, that there's two different perspectives on that. Uh, and I actually lean, you lean towards there being some more of a gap. I lean towards... I'm hearing my voice. I don't know, echoing I don't on your know, own. Echoing I'm not sure why. Not Maybe sure if you why. mute your mic. Okay. Yeah, that sounds better. So um, what I was saying is I, I, I lean towards there being like a very small gap or, or you know, it's very, very small, maybe no gap. You lean towards there being a gap, maybe three and a half year gap. And we'll see. We, neither one of us are dogmatic on that. And and I think that the fact that it mentions seven years of burning weapons uh, doesn't doesn't prove there's a gap. I think a seven year period is probably the seven year period It's the tribulation period. And then some believe that that proves that there's a three and a half gap, three and a half year gap. We'll see, you know, but then I was also going to comment on the 10 regions thing and how that's going to take time. I agree. I don't think. uh that it's going it can happen overnight. However, if we look at scripture and look at prophecy, those 10 regions are not in place at the beginning of the tribulation period. I don't see anywhere in scripture that says those, the world has to be put into 10 regions um, by the starting point of the tribulation period. All we know is that at some point there are 10 regions and they hand their authority over to the antichrist. I see that happening from my perspective in the first half of the tribulation period, somewhere in that three and a half year period, the world will form these 10 regions. And by the midpoint, we know they've handed their power and authority over to the Antichrist. And that's when it really, I mean, he's full on tyrant mode and you've got to take the mark of the beast and you have to worship him and all of that. So that's another one of those things where there's different perspectives on. I personally don't think that the 10 regions are going to be in place uh, at the beginning of the tribulation. I think that will take time, but it will be time that's during the first three and a half years somewhere in that window. So I like that we have yeah. different perspectives to talk about on that. Yeah, I mean, really, when we just take the the one over the world view of all of this, we we have to just look at the way the world is today and recognize that the world is going to be completely different for a period of seven years and that we're we're quickly coming upon that window of time right now so how that all transpires um i mean as christians we're not going to be here to see it so mm -hmm. but it's interesting to watch um 
the the shadows of it happening coming into fruition and as pablo would like to say or it says a lot these shadows are becoming crisper you know they're they're starting to t take form and you know it's like a picture on a computer that you've you've scrolled in really really far into it and you're seeing all the pixelization mm. and then now it's scrolling back out and the picture is starting to come into view and the closer we get the 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 more clear this picture is becoming so even i would say that with with if the world let's say by july the world has completely converted over to a digital currency and i don't it's not going to happen that quickly but we know that that certain parts of the economy around the world is converting over to this central bank digital currency as we speak and they're in the process of building this the infrastructure for that um even if that were to be let's say they fully went 100 percent in july there's still a uh, the logistics of transitioning the economy over to that. And you're right. You're right. I mean, but the, the mark of the beast may not be the, 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 uh, you know, take this or else scenario until like around the midpoint. So there is still a little bit of time, but all of this has to take place within seven years. So, I mean, you're talking about the way the world is today versus the way the world's going to look inside the 70th week. And it's two completely different pictures. So we are starting to see this transition now. And we know that the time is soon. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, let's just say that <clears throat> that we were to wait. Let's say the rapture wasn't for another 20 years. And this is completely hypothetical. We would be well, well within just just in the trajectory that we're now going. We would be well within uh, that beast kingdom structure um, already, you know, 10 yeah, years in, far. not even that far. So yeah. I, I think I don't, you know, the Antichrist only has seven years to rule and reign. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of biblical uh, evidence and reason, guys, to, to look at this very simply and go, okay. Somewhere in this 2023 to 2026 range is very exciting. And it's like time to watch seriously, really seriously. This is not make, making a prediction, but it's saying, look, this is time to get excited, time to watch. This should spur you on to share the gospel even more. And uh, Pete and I have talked about this many times. You know, once the restrainer steps aside from that role of restraining evil and the the Holy Spirit filled church has been taken out of here. Things are going to progress and, and go off a cliff quickly. The world will change in massive steps very quickly. You, if you, if you get people in worldwide uh, famine, worldwide war, you can very quickly herd people to certain areas very quickly, get rid of rights and things and traditions that people were used to. Um, na national boundaries, all these kind of things can very quickly vanish. Look what happened, guys, in the last three years. Things that never you never would have thought could occur just vanished. Rights vanished. Ways of doing things vanished. Uh, people submitting and succumbing to brainwashing and tyranny just boom. The whole world went, started being in lockstep imagine how that's going to happen after the rapture. It's going to happen fast and it will really quickly coalesce. And Satan knows and will certainly know during the tribulation period that his time is short and he will be pedal to the metal. And so this is this concept of looking at this 2000 year period is huge, very exciting. And I want to get into uh, now kind of going into further biblical typology things we haven't brought up yet that bolster this topic um so pete do you want to start or do you want me to start as far as getting into more stuff here now go ahead go ahead on and i'll jump in when you uh, cue me okay cool okay guys so so there's two patterns that we're going to talk about these. This is a little bit of review, but it's, but some of it's going to be new as well. There's two really important patterns to comprehend and to understand um, that help bolster this understanding. 
So first I want to mention Isaiah 46, 8 through 10. And if you see me looking over here a lot, it's because I have my notes over here. But this is important to understand. God has declared the end from the very beginning. So to say that, say that another way, God has been saying what's going to happen at the end. He's been telling you the, his whole plan from the very beginning. He's been declaring it. So let's read Isaiah 46, 8 through 10, where we get this. It says, remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. So one thing I want to point out to you guys is to really get this right here. We have God making a statement saying, I am the only one. I'm the only God that there is. And what is the first qualifier? What's like the first evidence that God presents right after he says that? It's his sovereignty over time. It's like he's like, here's how I can prove it to you. I'm the only one outside of time i see the whole thing i see the end from the beginning that's how he proves one of the ways one of the most powerful ways that he proves to us he is god he is what he says he is so the qualifier he lists is declaring the end from the beginning from ancient times things not yet done that's really really important to understand so let's go to the beginning and see, what did, what did God declare? Because you need to understand, God is, everything he does is declaration. He is declaring truth, not only in just his words, but in the spaces in between the words, in, in the actions, in the steps that he takes. It's all declaring his truth and declaring his plan. So the first thing, we go to the very beginning, Genesis, in the first book of the Bible, it says, God created the earth in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. There were six days of work and a seventh day of rest. So let's read Exodus 20, verse 11. It says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So this is what we call the, the year, the thousand year for a day concept. It's one of the oldest and most well understood prophetic concepts in the Bible. And we can go to second Peter three, eight, it says, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. That is not a throwaway statement. That is not Peter saying, Ah, time doesn't really matter to God. It's kind of generic to him or it doesn't really affect him. This is a very important thing Peter is calling to your attention. He says, do not overlook this one fact. Okay, so God from the beginning showed that there would be six days of work and a seventh day of rest. That was God declaring 7,000 years to human history. He had a 7,000 year plan. 6,000 of those years would be work. And then the final thousand years would be the day of rest, the, the kingdom of Jesus Christ on earth, which we call the millennial kingdom. And here's something that's really, really cool to understand. The fourth day of creation. So you go read the account in Genesis of the creation of the six days. It was on the fourth day that God created the sun, which is the light of the world. Well, it's it's not a coincidence, guys, at all that Jesus, which scripture, you know, scripture calls Jesus the light of the world. Jesus came in the 4000th year since the fall of Adam. So that's the fourth day. That the fourth day was the day God created the sun on the 4000 year mark or the fourth day, the 4000 year point in the 7,000 year plan of God was when Jesus, the light of the world, came into the world. Not a coincidence. That is God confirming this 
thousand year for a day plan that he declared from the beginning. He declared his plan from the beginning. And this is a 7,000 year plan. And it's incredible. That's a brief synopsis of it. Pete, do you have any, anything to add there on that 7,000 year plan? Because I want to go to a, the a three day concept after this one. Take me off mute. Um, yeah, just, you know, like I said last time that, that God could have created everything in a, in a blink of an eye. He could have spoke everything into existence in the blink of an eye. And we know that, that, you know, Moses mentioned that this pattern of work, working for six days and resting on the seventh, this was done for our benefit. Um, it, it was done as a, a type for us to model after. And then we could look at his history and see that this is being played out. Um, so unless all, you know, unless all of this typology gets broken, and unless all of history suddenly becomes irrelevant because of the pattern we've seen, then then um, that's the only way that that would really make this coming ten years insignificant. But you know, as Chuck Missler used to say, past is prologue. You know, this the past is just foreshadowing things that are coming, and so as as bible believing christians god has given us the scripture to to use to to learn to live by and also to know what's coming and so i can't believe that he would give us all of this typology and very clear typology and very clear symbolism and very clear uh you know numerology and everything else in scripture the use of the number 7 or the use of number 40 the 3 so on and so forth um I looked up, I just had a curiosity. I looked up some, some numbers because I wanted to know what, you know, what the occurrence was in it. And, um, on the first day, the phrase on the first day is used 36 times on the sec on the third day is used 26 times. And on the seventh day is used 39 times. The rest of the numbers, when it, you put in that phrase and you plug in any kind of number, it's, it's like, you know, maybe five, five instances, but these, there is a significance to these to these phrasing and to the to the numbers of these days. They they usually mean something. There was something associated with them. Just like the number forty is associated with judgment and testing. Um, I think that the six day model or the seven day model with the six days of work and the seven day of rest is a clear clear um, typological symbol for us to use. And rec just recognizing the power and authority of God that, that if he wanted to, he could have spoke the universe into existence on the first day and the first moment and the first fraction of time, but chose to break it out this way. And the fact that Moses said it was this way, <laughs> and then the fact that Jesus reiterated what Moses wrote um, is something I think that we should take seriously. So, Yeah, amen. I love that point. I mean, e easily, guys, God could have done it all in a second, in a moment. He did it that way because he was showing us his plan. And he knew that you and I would be sitting here in 2023, almost 6,000 years from the fall of Adam and be able to look back on all this and go, wow, only God can declare the end from the beginning. He has been showing us his plan from the beginning and that's God's sovereignty over time and only God has that. So I wanted to bring up this, here's the second pattern. Okay. And, and this is something that Chuck Missler learned from um, Jewish rabbis. They, to the Jewish rabbi, they would say pattern is prophecy. They saw this, the Jewish rabbis, e even, you know, those Jewish rabbis who don't accept Jesus as their Messiah, they're able to look at Old Testament prophecy and see how God worked in typologies or patterns. It's very clear. God declares what he's going to do. So the Old Testament was all pointing towards Jesus. And uh, New Testament prophecy also points towards Jesus. It's all pointing to Jesus. Uh, except for, you know, of course, the Jews don't understand that. Yeah, they don't understand he's their Messiah. But here's the second pattern that I wanted to cover. So we that you got the seven-day pattern now, guys. 
that was kind of review. So let's get into some some new stuff that we haven't covered. Let's talk about the third day, the third day pattern. This is huge in scripture, like Pete just mentioned. You get your Bible app and look up third day on the third day. It's all over scripture, New Testament and Old Testament. But I want to read you some things and I'm going to pull up a chart as well. But I want to read you this. Uh, Mark 9, 31. Jesus, it says, for he taught his disciples and said to them, the son of man is delivered into the hands of men and they shall kill him. And after that, he is killed. He shall rise the third day. This is very important. The passion of Jesus Christ was was done in a pattern, in a very specific pattern for a huge prophetic reason. It was not happenstance. It didn't just work out that way. It happened the way God planned for it to happen. Jesus died on Passover as our Passover lamb. It was literally a, a, an appointment in history. With the, the Hebrew a word for the feast of Passover is moed. That means an appointment. God had an appointment with men, mankind that he set up thousands of years prior and Jesus came in the 4,000th uh, year mark, you know, the fourth day, just like he was supposed to. He died and he sacrificed, he gave himself on the cross on Passover. It was all on time. And when Jesus says the son of man is delivered into the hands of men and they shall kill him. And after that, he is killed. He shall rise the third day. That was all on purpose. That timing was very much uh, God declaring a truth. And I want to read another scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, 4. It says, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And we know this from the gospel. So I want to show you guys a chart that I made that kind of goes over this, this third day or three day pattern and we're going we're gonna to talk about this. I hope this kind of helps it become kind of clear and simple to grasp. Uh, let me make it a bit bigger here. So here's the three-day pattern. So what you, you see on the cross, you see the cross there on the left. That's when Jesus was crucified. So you have night one, day one, night two, day two, night three, day three. And just like Jesus said, the son of man is delivered into the hands of men and they shall kill him. And after that, he's killed. He shall rise the third day. So that yellow arrow you see pointing up at the far right, that's Jesus rising from the grave on the third day. And this is awesome that we're talking about this as we're coming up to Resurrection Sunday and, you know, thinking about that empty tomb. Amen. So. This is, this is the three-day pattern, and I want you to see something here, and don't miss this, okay? So the green there, you see it says day one, gone, day two, gone, day three, returned. So for the disciples and the, the people who were, you know, Jesus' followers, he was with them he got crucified they saw him get crucified and then night one day one he was away from them night two day two he was away from them night three day three the night three he was away from them day three for a little bit of it he was away from them but he returned and they uh, went to the tomb and he resurrected the third day just as he said he would so there's this pattern that god was showing of one day gone, two day gone, third day return. And this blue down here at the bottom, you'll see it says 1,000 years, 1,000 years, 1,000 years. So we'll get into that more later. But I, this concept of a thousand years for a day, like we went over with the seven day pattern, how it stands for 7,000 years. Remember, G Jesus came at the 4,000 year mark. So from the cross is 1,000 years after the cross, that would be 5,000. 
another thousand, that's 6,000. So we are somewhere right at the end of day two. We are somewhere very much near the end of 6,000 years from the fall of Adam. Jesus came at the 4,000 year mark is day one, day two, that's 2,000 years since Jesus. And then the third day would be that seventh day of rest or that 1,000 year millennial kingdom. And that is when Jesus should be back, should be returned. And we have his 1,000 year millennial kingdom going. So I really wanted to kind of lay this understanding of the seven day pattern and the three day pattern. And Pete, jump in on this one too. No, I like that, man. Um, I think I think a lot of people get, um, or I don't say a lot of people, some people have gotten thrown by the phrasing in Hosea 6 where it says after two days, mm -hmm. uh, he will revive us. And then on the third day, he will raise us up. And that's, and, and there's no, there, that's really just saying on the third day, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so after two days and then on the third day, he's going to raise us up. And I think people were getting a little confused uh, last time that, that there was some kind of a, a distinction between after two days and then on the third day. Mm -hmm. So it's really just another way of saying on the third day, but it's really taking into account the first two days of what's happening during that time period. So, and kind of like what we looked at last time with um, the chart that we had up last time, uh, we're just taking into account this, what is it? Uh, 1990 years uh, that have led up to this point where we are today and just how, how history is broken down. And, and like your previous chart, the fig tree generation had to come about with the rebirth of Israel and without Israel back in our land, none of us would really understand where we were on God's time, time uh, prophetic calendar, because there's always been wars. There's always been famines. There's always been earthquakes. There's always been pestilence. Um, but we see it coming into a, uh, a culmination point only after Israel has come into her land again mm -hmm. as a nation after nearly 2000 years. So um I, I like this. I'm, this is the first time I've seen it, so I'm digging it. Yeah, we, you know, Pete and I are dispensationalists, so we got to have our charts, you know. <laughs> have to. Yeah. <laughs> so this this is just a very simple, and I, you're going to have to mute your mic, mic, Pete. I don't know why, but I, I hear the echo. But um, this is a very simple thing, guys, that if we understand these two patterns of the the day for a year, 7,000 year plan of God and this three day pattern. Both of these things are prophetic declarations of God. It's God declaring his sovereignty over time. And um, this is very important. And, and Pete, you brought up Hosea six, which we covered in depth in our last video, but that is another one of those things that makes us really excited about where we are in time, because that's a prophecy saying that, you know, after 2000 years or after two days, God would revive Israel, that Israel would be back. And, and sure enough, Israel, here we are in this later part of, of you know, uh, time since the cross and Israel became a nation again. And uh, they, Israel has been revived. And we know that on when it says in Hosea 6 that on the third day you will raise us up, you will exalt us uh the third day represents the millennial kingdom. So you, you need to understand it's the third day since the cross. So there's, there's four days before those three days of Hosea 6. So when we talk about that third day in Hosea 6, that is the seventh day. That's the day of rest. And so it is in that millennial kingdom, that seventh day, or three days since the cross, which the cross happened on the, Jesus came on the fourth day, the 4,000 year mark. But on that seventh day in that millennial kingdom, God will literally 
rule and reign from Israel. Israel will be lifted up. Jerusalem will be lifted up above the nations. And God will rule and reign from there. And this, we are right in now in time, somewhere at the end of those two days and not very far into the future now. That's why we're looking at this final four kind of window. The tribulation is going to happen and then the second coming is going to happen and God, Jesus is going to set up his millennial kingdom. And that, that third day or that seventh day of rest, same thing, is going to begin. How awesome is that? So, Pete, you can get into uh, some stuff, and and then I'll I've got two more really cool things to share, and even some more charts to share. But I'm gonna let you. I know you've got some stuff you want to bring up, and and I want to hear it, man. Well, yeah, you know, just looking at your, you don't have to bring the chart back, but just looking at it and and seeing the two days, and on the third day, it it reminds me of how God works in thirds, you know. Um, if we look back at all the major, uh, milestones in scripture, um, let's, you know, you could take Moses life and break it into thirds, you know, 40 years, 40 years and 40 years. Um, you can take the three Kings, you can take, uh, you know, of, of uh, Saul, uh, David and Solomon. You can take, I mean, there's just the, the three iterations of the, the generations of Christ in Matthew chapter one. Right. Um, so it seems to me that there's always a, when we look at patterns, there's the third comes into play quite a bit. And even if you get into the judgments, you know, a third of the earth is burned up. A third of the fresh waters are are made bitter. A third of the seas are turned to blood. So there's 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 some kind of a divine uh, significance to this idea of the third. And we see Satan mimicking God, too, in this, because. He takes this third as well. He took a third of the angels fell with him, right? Um, he targeted three of, uh, of, of Adam's sons, their named sons that are written in scripture, and he converted one of them, right? So he got one third. He got Cain. We see him ta attack Noah's sons, and he gets Ham. And through Ham, Canaan's curse, and then Canaan's, um, or then uh, uh, Cush's son is uh, Nimrod, who may have belonged to Canaan actually um, is, is also this first, the world's first, you know, uh, world tyrant and who was the, uh, a, a prototype of what the antichrist would be one day. So we see Satan working in thirds as well. So this idea of the, the three days. So if you have the seven days of creation and now we're kind of taking a microscope and going into it a little bit. Now we're getting into the, the three days of that um, is, is I think we're on, you know, biblical solid ground, biblically speaking to, to look at this because of the way that that pattern is laid out in scripture repeatedly. So. Yeah, man, I completely agree. Um, and guys, I, I have done a whole, I saw some people in the chat talking about the seven day, 7,000 year plan thing and wanting to learn more. Um, a year or two ago, I did a full video where I really go into depth and I'll link that later in the description below and, and we'll link everything we can think of in a pinned comment below later as well. But you can go check that stuff out if you want to dig deeper into that. Um, but he, let me bring up something on speaking of the threes. Another thing that came to my mind when you were talking was how a third of, of Israel, you know, that will be the remnant that God preserves through the tribulation. It's very clearly God uh, works in certain ways and, and it's all for a reason, guys. It's not just because he happens to like the number three. Uh, it's, it's all something that can reveal truth to us. But let me talk about this. This is really neat. Speaking of three days and this and zooming in, because you can lay, like you were saying, Pete, you, we, you can overlay this three day period overlay that on top of the seven day pattern the three days is the last three so it's day five six seven but we're zooming in and looking at that three day period from from the cross forward so let's read this verse matthew thirteen thirty three. it says another parable spake he jesus 
unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. And this is, is a really like enigmatic parable. It's a mysterious parable. And the key really is in that word hid and hid three measures of meal. Because if you go to look at the other parables of the kingdom of, of heaven, it will become very clear. And I, I went over this in my video called the great dividing line. But it's very clear, guys, that Jesus says the kingdom of heaven, this is the whole world. This is the field which God has sowed seeds into. That And Jesus says that. He says the, the field is the world. And he, God is the one who has sowed the seeds. The kingdom of heaven is the whole world. And so what, when you look at this parable, though, not the sower parable, but this parable about the woman, it says, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Well, again, the kingdom of heaven is the whole world. It's the field which God has sowed into. But this parable is about the hidden work of God until the whole work, his whole plan is completed. So we see here three measures or three sections of time until the fullness of time is completed or the fullness of God's work, God's hidden work is completed. So remember, we have six days he created or worked and on the seventh day he rested. So what I believe that this parable is talking about, it says the kingdom of heaven is like an leaven which a woman took and hid three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. God's plan for re the redemption of man, his, the time that God has worked on the earth, his hidden work has been for three measures, three sections. Remember thirds, it's a huge thing to God. Three sections of 2,000 years each. So you had a 2,000 years from like Adam to Israel, 2,000 years from Israel to the cross, 2,000 years from the cross to uh, Jesus' return at, at his second coming. So that would be the three measures of leaven until the, the whole thing was complete. So clearly we have three sec sections of time in which the work of God will be completed. And, and that's, you know, two times three equals six. That's the 6,000 years of work. And then there's a coming seventh day. There's a coming millennial kingdom rest. And this scripture ties in with that. It says Ephesians 1, 9 through 12, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one, Jesus, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. So that's that, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things. That's what this parable is talking about, that there's three measures that have been hidden in there until the whole thing is leavened, until the whole uh, work, the hidden work of God is completed. And I think it's just beautiful how God has laid these things out from the beginning. What do you think, brother? Well, that, that reminds me of the, when you brought up the, the, the seven kingdom parables, um, the, the three sets of three with this. So you have the three king, the uh, seven kingdom parables. You have the seven churches that Paul wrote to, and then you have the seven churches that Jesus wrote to, and you can overlay all three of those on top of each other. And they fit perfectly. But if even if you take it even further, within the uh, seven churches that Jesus spoke to and, and wrote to in, in Revelation 2 and 3, 
only three of those churches really had uh, two of them had nothing negative written about them at all, no condemnation at all. And that was the Church of Smyrna and the Church of Philadelphia. And then the other church, which was pretty good and had a kind of a, a slight rebuke, but was better than the other churches in terms of the number of things they were rebuked over, was the first church, which is Ephesus. So three of the seven churches, though, have more good than negative about them as well. So I don't know. I just I find that fascinating how all these things kind of tie in together. No, yeah. It's amazing how God is has laid these things out and and um I guess if it's a unless do you have something else you want to get into first or I was I was going to get into I want to talk about the tabernacle and the temple but I want to make sure that you don't have um something you wanted to cover first before we get into that no no I and since we didn't uh really get together before this and share or compare things i want to make sure that i don't step on your toes <laughs> so you go okay. and then i'll and i'll jump in after you yeah see this is fun for me and pete guys we we kick around things like this and we talk to each other but we i don't know pete's notes and he doesn't know mine and so sometimes we might have different perspectives on things and sometimes we might uh show each other things that we haven't thought of and and that's what i love about this that this is why I don't like to just always teach by myself. I love to bring in Pete and other brothers in Christ who can we can teach together and we can be iron sharpening iron and we can point out things that the other person might not have noticed and we can add on things. It's a it's a blessing to work together as the body of Christ. I love that. So We've we've kind of laid a, a, a good foundation, and this is kind of the coolest thing, or the thing that I'm most excited about bringing up tonight, is is talking about the tabernacle. This is really neat. I believe that the layout of the tabernacle, the layout, the architecture of the tabernacle, is a prophecy displaying the pattern God had planned from the beginning of his plan for the redemption of man. And um, let's take a, a deep look at this and, and let's look at the temple. So the tabernacle in, in, in the temple, you can find this in, um, I think it's Solomon's temple in, in second Chronicles chapter three. Um, you can check me on that, Pete, I might be wrong or, but it, this, the tabernacle and Solomon's temple, they have this same pattern to them. They were divided into two sections. There was the holy place, uh, which was 40 by 20 cubits. And there was the most holy place or the holy of holies, which was 20 by 20 cubits. This pattern was in both. So what I want you to catch there when you're looking at the, the tabernacle, the temple, you have a section that's two thirds. And again, here come the thirds, you know. You have a section that's two thirds and then you have another section that's one third. And I think that's very much for a reason. I think it's very prophetic. Uh, so I want to read you some verses and then I'm going to show you some charts and kind of get into this concept. First, I want to read Hebrews 5, 8. It says, this is talking about how God has a pattern of, of this laid out in heaven. It says, Hebrews 5, 8, they serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. A copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, which is where the tabernacle was, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. And remember the first part of that verse, it says it's a copy and shadow of the, what is in heaven. Okay, very important. God has a divine pattern that he showed to Moses on how the tabernacle was to be laid out. Hebrews 9.24 says, For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. 
So Jesus, our high priest, he went into the real, the heavenly tabernacle in the Holy of Holies and presented his blood as the sacrifice for our sins to cleanse us and atone for our sins. So here's the thing. I believe that God laid out the tabernacle in a very specific pattern to display an incredible prophetic truth and literally to declare, like it says in Isaiah, declaring the end from the beginning, to declare his sovereignty over time, over time itself. So I want to bring up some charts here. And uh, Pete hasn't seen these either yet. So um, I'm going to bring up some charts and we're going to go over this concept of, of um, what, what I call the tabernacle of time. So here's the chart here. I'll try and make it here a little bit bigger for you guys. So this rectangle here, this represents the pattern that God had Moses uh, and Solomon um, lay out the holy place and the most holy place, the tabernacle. And the first section, again, was 40 cubits, 40 by 20 cubits. And the second section, which is the most holy place to the holy of holies, was 20 cubits. So there's a two thirds and a one third. I believe that this pattern shows 4,000 years. And then there's a, there's a curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place. So there's a 4,000 years. Then there's Jesus. He's the one that bridges that gap. He tore that curtain when he was uh, crucified on the cross. That curtain was torn from top to bottom. And then you have 2,000 years after Jesus. So this is God displaying his sovereignty over time, laying it out for us in the architecture of the tabernacle. So that first 40 cubits holy place section, that first two thirds represents, if you look at the bottom here on the arrow line of time, this represents the Old Testament in this area. So for 4,000 years, you had things like, you know, conscience and the law and the prophets. Then comes Jesus. And after Jesus, after the cross, we have uh, the fullness of the gospel revealed and we are covered in his blood. And, and that's representing the most holy place, being covered in the blood of Jesus, the ultimate high priest. So that's why you, you see I, I put Jesus there in that section. So all together, that represents 6,000 years of God's work, just like that parable of three measures uh, of, of leaven until the whole was was leavened three le measures of meal that's three sections of 2,000 years the first two-thirds was the 4,000 years and the final third is Jesus that represents the 6,000 years of God's hidden work and and again I want to go back to that concept that the thing that separated that first 4,000 years from the last 2,000 years it the thing that separated the holy place in the tabernacle from the holy of holies, the most holy place, was that big, thick curtain. And our sins separated us from God. We could not have fellowship and communion with God because of our sins. And it was Jesus who came and bridged that gap by his shedding his blood on the cross so that now we are cleansed and clean in God's sight, those of us who place our faith in Jesus, and we can be having communion. There's no separation anymore between the Holy of Holies and us. And I wanted to read this verse, Mark 15, 37 through 38. It says, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And this was symbolic of Jesus ripping apart that separation by the work that he did on that cross and opening now 
to us to have uh, access to the throne, to the Holy of Holies, to have access to God. So this, let me show you one other chart, uh, and I'll bring this one back up uh, in a second. Hold on, let me, let me grab this other one here really quick. I'm going to bring another chart up. That's just another way to look at this. Okay, so here's a more kind of visual representation of the tabernacle that Moses built. So you can see the tabernacle of time. So you've got, there's 20 cubits and 40 cubits there in white. So that first section of 40 cubits, two thirds, that's the holy place. And then this back part where the Ark of the Covenant is, the mercy seat, that's the holy of holies. So again, there's, if you look at the yellow lettering, there's three sections of 20 cubits, 2,000 years, 2,000 years, and 2,000 years. The cross is right there where the curtain is. That's the thing that separated this 4,000-year period from this 2,000-year period. And again, 4 plus 2 equals 6, so that's 4,000 years here, 2,000 years here, that's 6,000 years of God's work that he had declared from the beginning as his hidden work, how he would accomplish the redemption of men, paying the, the price for our sins and the, the mystery of, of, of Jesus' work that he for, you know, ordained since the foundation of the world. So, um, Pete, I want you to uh, jump in now before we move further, because to me, this is so cool to see how God laid things out this way. Yeah, and, and I'm 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 backtracking a little bit on the thirds on this because I you know looking at the tabernacle it's got me thinking about how Jesus considered his body of the tabernacle how we our bodies are tabernacles and then it got me thinking about that we are we are divided into three parts mm -hmm. as humans you know body which is the soma the soul the pneuma and or the um, Body, soul, and spirit. The body is the soma. The soul is the psyche, and the and the and the spirit is the the pneuma. And when you look at uh, when we depart, uh, you know, when we depart out of out of here, like if we if we were to die tonight before the rapture, you're leaving with one, you know, two thirds of your body. You're leaving with your soul and your spirit, and you're leaving the the third part, the flesh in the ground right and then if you take that out and you want to expand it out and considering how god separated out the jewish people god divided mankind into thirds you have jews gentiles and the church and so when you think back through the bible the genesis chapter 1 through genesis 11 god is dealing largely with just mankind in general which we would consider gentiles and then out of the gentile race he pulled one man out abram and says i'm going to make a great nation out of you and then he gives him the what we would call the patriarchy we has abraham isaac and jacob and through them we have the 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 tribes of israel the 12 tribes of israel that go forth and end up in bondage for 400 years. And then they are led out of, out of Egypt by Moses, whose life itself was partitioned into three 40 year sections. And they go into the wilderness for 40 years where this is, where this is uh, given to them by Moses. He goes up on a mountain and doesn't eat for 40, doesn't eat or drink for 40 days. Right. And so, uh, then this ta this tabernacle is then divided into three parts. I just, I man, I love how this is. This is so cool how God does all this, you know. And uh, Genesis one through eleven, God's dealing with mankind, mostly Gentile, or uh, it's all Gentile. And then from Genesis twelve onward, uh, through really the end of the Gospels, 
you know, God is dealing with the nation of Israel. And he only mentions at that point, the Gentiles and how they relate to the Jewish people. You know, the story is not about the Gentiles anymore. It's only, they only factor in until, you know, in, in how they interact with the Jewish people. The story of the focus is on Israel. And then after from Acts on, it's about the church. So the Bible there is also divided into, you know, three main subsections uh, dealing with the different types of, of uh, interest or points of interest in scripture. So I don't know, man, I, I just I get uh, geeked out over all this stuff. So I just love how it how it all um, factors in. Then you could look at the three facets of Christ's ministry, prophet, priest, king. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll <laughs> I could go off on a huge rabbit trail right now, and I don't want to do that. But uh, so I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, I mean, it's just incredible, it's just incredible. I, I, guys. God has been declaring His plan in 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 every way possible since the beginning. He's been showing that He's got a plan of redemption, and and it's it's in heaven. Abraham, uh, Moses was showed shown the pattern from heaven of, of how to lay this out. And God has been declaring, look, we're, we've got six days of work. There's a seventh day of rest coming and it's going to be divided up like this 4,000 years before the cross. And it's, it's uh, the old Testament period. Then you have the cross and that, and that curtain was ripped and it, guys, this curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. You can go read about this in the Bible. It was incredibly thick. And, and it was, I mean, something that a human, there's no way a human could have ripped this curtain. And it was ripped from the top to the bottom. Just showing that it was a work of God. And that's the cross. And it happened at the moment of the cross. And then you have this, this 2,000 years since Jesus. But here's the cool thing, guys. We're right there at the end of this 6,000-year period of God's work. And there's a seventh day coming. There's a day of rest coming. Uh, Hebrews 4, 8 through 10 says, For if Joshua had given them rest... God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. We know that God rested from his work on the seventh day. And guys, we will rest Humanity will rest from the work on this seventh day. And that seventh day, this millennial 1,000-year kingdom that Jesus is going to come set up at the end of the tribulation period is fast approaching. And again, if we look at that, uh, let, me, let me pull up that other uh, chart about the 2,000 years while we're, we're talking about this. If we look at this chart, listen, this, this period, we're, we're not far off. We're not far away from this seventh day, this day of rest should, from what we can tell based off when the cross was, which is pretty much agreed somewhere around 30 AD to 33 AD, it would, it would stand to reason that Jesus comes and sets his kingdom up somewhere from 2030 to 2033. That would be logical. I'm not claiming that thus says the Lord and that's what it's going to be. I'm saying it would, it's reasonable to look at this. It's, it's logical to think this way. And God laid things out in a pattern to declare the end from the beginning as he said, don't be afraid to take God at his word. Some people are, are crippled with this thought of, well, since there's differing opinions out there, then we can't really know. Boulder Dash, God did not give you his word and give you his prophecy 
for you to just not know, for you to be clueless, for you to say, well, there's no way to really know. And, and, and listen, people are going to get angry at you if you if you actually believe you actually believe in what you what you say, like you believe for real that God's coming back. You believe for real that we don't have, you know, decades to go. We don't have generations to go. You think you take this that literally? Yes, I do. When Jesus came the first time, he scolded the Pharisees for not discerning the times. They should have known because of Bible prophecy that it was the time for the Messiah to show up. Now you should know that it is the time for the rapture to occur, the seven-year tribulation period to begin, and the second coming of Jesus to happen at the end of that, which starts his millennial kingdom seventh day of rest you should know that it's time for that and don't be afraid to act like it and to actually believe it i'm not afraid to stand on god's word and i'm not claim claiming again that it is absolutely for sure that i'm right because i'm a human i'm fallible we look we see dimly as through a mirror but we're going off of pretty reasonable pretty solid base things here talking about the day of the cross talking about this two-day concept the the way god has ordained this pattern for time it's very very reasonable to be getting very excited right about now because these these are exciting times and i absolutely believe god's going to fulfill his plan what do you think brother <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think the evidence uh, being as it is today uh, is becoming so abundant and overwhelming that even, uh, you know, who we would consider, you know, secular commentators and secular um, movies, television shows, everybody is, everybody is, is senses that something big is about to change mm -hmm. and and uh, you know it, it's the world might attribute it to the singularity they might attribute it to gaia or whatever but they sense they sense this change coming and i think that is because within the church who has the holy spirit living with inside them and in prompting them to get busy about the lord's work um, this nudging in this fire that he's put in our bones is uh, obviously this is a work of God and this is where we should be. And I, and I, you know, let's just say that um, the rapture wasn't, let's just say we knew definitively the rapture wasn't going to be for another hundred years. You know, um, would that make you more urgent to share the gospel or less urgent to share the gospel? And I think that one of the criticisms about, you know, looking at the rapture and and watching and waiting is that we uh, it's a distraction from evangelism. I think it's an enabler for for evangelism. I think that that if anything, it's emboldened me to share the gospel in a way that I never would have if I thought that you know the second coming was in another was another hundred years off or whatever. Um, and not only is it an enabler, it's a sustainer. Mm -hmm. um, because I know things are coming to an end and I know I can hold on until then because I know that it's not going to be that long. And even if it isn't, even if I die tomorrow, um, then I win either way. It's a win-win situation for me and for every believer that has this blessed hope. And that's why it's called the blessed hope. It's called the blessed hope because it is designed to encourage us. Intent, that's the intent of it. And that's why Paul expected it in his day. The, the church there at Thessalonica believed it was in their day and generations following believed it would be in their day. And, and I know that it's been 2000 years, um, but it's, it's, it's sustained every generation and that's mm -hmm. the way God intended it to be. Right. If God said in uh, let's call third Corinthians and in, in chapter 14, it says in verse six, uh, that the rapture would happen on in the year 2050. How encouraging would that be to somebody in the first century or oh. the second century or the, the fifth or the whatever? I mean, 
What a beatdown. <laughs> There is there is a reason why no man knows the day or the hour, and I and what here's my pet peeve about people that 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 harp on us about watching and waiting for the Lord to return. Um, you know, Matthew twenty four thirty six that passage, no man knows the day or the hour. That passage swings both ways, right? Yeah, I can't know the exact day or the hour when the Lord's going to return, but you don't know either, right? You know. You, Mr. Critic, don't know when it's going to happen. So in Scripture, are people uh, rebuked and chastised by the Lord for uh, watching and waiting for him and being eager for him? Or are they rebuked because they aren't looking for him and they aren't watching and they aren't waiting for him? I mean, cl the clear, um, abundant, overwhelming, 100%, it is the rebuke against those who, who don't wait and who don't watch. And that is a command that is given in Mark 13, 36. That we are commanded to watch, right? And it's it's uh, throughout throughout the Gospels, God is Jesus is telling us to watch and be ready. And you can't be ready if you're not watching. And I think that I think that is emboldened my walk personally in a way that I don't think anything else could have. Amen. Uh, me too. And I want to get back to uh, I want to talk about this temple or tabernacle of time here. I'm hearing a um, echo again, brother. Oh, sorry about that. That's all right. Um, I want to talk one more thing about this tabernacle of time. This 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 way that this pattern that God has laid out time for us um, on how He's He's going to work to to bring about the redemption of man. Because listen, that's what this this tabernacle architecture uh, declares. I believe uh, it shows how God has laid out time. And what's important to remember though, is after this 6,000 years, the, the, there is this millennial kingdom, this seventh day of rest. I want to talk about that a little bit. And I wanted to read revelation 20 verse four. And this is a really, really cool verse because it actually shows us several things, but it says, then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So there you see the seventh day the day of rest that comes after this 6,000 year period that God has declared and laid out for us by, by this you know, pattern such as the temple and the seven days of creation and on and on and on. But what's, what's really neat is go back and look at this verse, Revelation 20, verse four closely and see a couple things. First, it lists two groups, and they're distinct groups. And there's very interesting things about each group. It says, then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom authority to judge was committed. Stop right there. That is the church. You can go through all the promises and all the scriptures and the prophecies in the New Testament. It's very clear that we uh, will be given kings and uh, I'm sorry, crowns, we will be given the iron rod uh, that um, Jesus talks about. And I think it's Revelation chapter two, the rod of iron that he was given. He will also give to us to church, to the church, to rule over the nations with. We will keep we will be kings and priests. It will be we will be co-heirs with Jesus and we will rule and reign with him. So this is speaking about the church. And notice it doesn't call them souls. It says they were seated on thrones and they had the authority to judge. This is the church which has already been raptured and we have our glorified bodies. We're not just souls. Then the second group, it says also, now we're talking about a sec separate group. I saw the souls. So these don't have bodies yet at this point. 
And this point in time is the end of the tribulation period. And Jesus has come back. That's where we are in time here. It says, I saw the souls, don't have bodies, of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. This is the tribulation saints, not the church that was raptured before the tribulation. This is the tribulation saints. They went through the tribulation. And they are souls at this point in time. They do not have their bodies. But at this point now, it says, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. It is at the end of the tribulation period, those who died during the tribulation, the tribulation saints, those who placed their faith in Jesus during the tribulation, will resurrect and receive bodies. And together with us, the church, who are already seated, excuse me, who are already seated on thrones, they will rule and reign with us and Christ for the thousand year period, that day of rest. So it's so cool how much we can see here from one verse in Revelation chapter 20. I can't hear you. Cool, man. That's cool. I was just marking it in my Bible. I was like, man, I never really paid attention to that before. So even I'm learning tonight. <laughs> uh, dude, uh, I don't know. We've got we've still got so much to cover. Um, we didn't even go through all of our list of thirds <laughs> on the third I mean, day. I mean, yeah, there's no way we can um, cover it all. It's it's so vast, isn't it? Let me you want me to read those because I can I can read off those. Uh, you can you the can read them day. real quick, I guess. Yeah. I didn't know if you had that already queued up to do. No, that. I don't. That's kind of. I just had a few more comments, but I that was mostly but, of what I have I, in my notes. Oh, well, you know, going back to the idea of of us coming very qu quickly to the end of the second day and approaching the third day, we've talked about the significance of that. You know, with regards to. Uh, Christ prophesying about his crucifixion um, and he ties that back to, to Jonah, the sign of Jonah being in the, the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights mm -hmm. um, but there were so many uh, references or, and, or uh, mentions of this on the third day that have biblical significance you have uh, beginning in the Old Testament in Genesis 22 Abraham uh, was going to sacrifice Isaac on the third day. You know, uh, Joseph's brethren were held in prison until the third day. Uh, you got in Exodus 19, on the, th on the third day, the Lord came down from Mount Sinai. Um, you've got, uh, again, in Exodus 19, God verbally, or God gave the law to uh God gave the law to Moses at uh, Sinai on the third day. Um, David uh, was hid in the field from Saul until the third day. David learned of Saul and Jonathan's death on the third day. Hezekiah uh, went up to the temple and was healed on the third day. Um, the second temple uh, was finished on the third day of Adar. Uh, we got Esther, who uh, stood before the king of Persia on the third day. In uh, Esther chapter 5, Israel is going to be restored on the third day. Jesus turns uh, water into wine on the third day in the, the marriage at Cana. You got uh, the parable of the uh, Good Samaritan, um, where uh, I have to go back and find that parable. Do you have it on, on, on hand? I could pull it up. Yeah. And then uh, Jesus stays with the Samaritans for two days and departs on the third day. Uh, rebuilding the temple again, you know, speaking this in several passages of, of tearing down the temple or destroying the temple and raise and raising up on the third day, Matthew 26, 61, 17, 30, Mark 14, 58. So do you got that? Do you have that parable? Yeah. Do you want me to read it? Uh, yeah. It says um, Luke chapter 10, verse 30, 33. It says, but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. 
he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever you spend I will repay you when I come back. That's the, is that the part you wanted me to read? Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, yeah, that was it. Okay. I just, there's so many, there's so many just, uh, and even the things that we talked about last time uh, with regard to the parable uh, of the fig tree. Um, where was that at? I think it's Luke 13. Anyways, um, th this this idea of the the third day uh, is where we are we are rapidly coming up to, and I don't see how we go past you know any further really than ten years um, without this without there being some significant change to the to the world order from God's prophetic plan. Just ba simply based on everything that we see in scripture, mm -hmm. right? And then if you add on top of that, everything that we're seeing going on in the world today, everything is is pointing very rapidly to this coming beast kingdom. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, it would be very, I would be very, 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 very surprised um if if things did not come to a head within the next four years so that's that's just my my two cents on it but i agree it, it would have to really it would have to really uh throw off all of the typology that we've discussed it would have to throw off all the the patterns that we see in scripture it would have to throw off the patterns we see in history it would have to throw off all of the prophetic trends we've seen happen since 1948 with regards to where the direction the world's heading to. I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, you know, just like you uh, read earlier with Isaiah 46, eight through 10, that God tells, you know, declares the end from the beginning. And um, I don't, we're just taking this at a very, you know, historical, grammatical, literal interpretation you know, we're not coming at it with crazy, wild eye, cultist, <laughs> um, you know, radical interpretations, right? Um, you know, like some some cult leaders have done in the past. I mean, we're just taking it for what it says, and this is the plain reading of scripture. So, um, I don't know. I, it, it has to be. It has yes. to be. And, and like I mentioned, um, I, I don't know a while back with you. You know, when I first read Don Koenig's article, when when will Christ return? And he had every uh, every one of the proposed theories out there. And he went through the dates, the, the proposed timing in that. And then he came down with all of those, took the average, you know, and, it, you know, it ended up being between the mid 20s and the mid 30s for, for the second coming. So, you know, everything that has to happen prior to that. So I don't know we're I mean we're there and I don't there. I know it seems weird because we are um we're we're here living in the time right now but um you know when I first read this you know what 15 years ago uh, it seemed like an eternity away <laughs> it seemed like oh that yeah. is the mid 20s I'm reading this in 2009 I was like and that is so I you know I saw myself with a long grizzly beard and like you know just <laughs> you know, uh, walking around in a, with a cane or something. That's how far away it seemed to me. And now that we're here, we don't want to believe it. We don't yeah. want to believe that it's, it's, we're in the window now. And most, most Christians want to just put their head back in the sand and not deal with it. The reality that we're, we're here, you know, I think so, we really fight. Uh, we fight our normalcy bias. You know, we, we, as our, hu our, our flesh as humans, we are like, Oh, you can't, it can't be. It's kind of like that thing that everybody, you know, everyone goes through a tragedy. They're always like, I thought it would never happen to me, or I never thought it would happen here. Or, I never thought it would happen to me. That's normalcy bias. And so we have this normalcy bias of thinking, no, there's no way we can be there. It can't be now. 
But the, here's what you need to cut through that. You need the word of God, which is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing the dividing joint and marrow, soul and spirit. And the word of God tells you where we are. It's a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path, scripture says. And so look at scripture. Look at what God has declared here by, by the patterns that he has laid out. I mean, we're there. We're there. We're, it's time. You should be watching. And another thing I wanted to bring up about this, this temple thing is really cool. The tabernacle of time, you know, that, that first section, the holy place, which was, you know, represents like the first 4,000 years before the cross, you know, that first section, which is called the holy place, that's representative of the priests who continually have to offer sacrifices um, basically representing the law, which could not bring true redemption or justification, you know? Uh, and then that last section, the Holy of Holies, which comes after the cross, if you're looking at it as a, as a perspective of time, that last section, that one third section representing the 2000 years following Jesus sacrifice on the cross, that represents the area where the high priest only can come in and only once a year. So in the Holy of Holies, that, that section of the tabernacle, only the high priest could go into there. And that only once in a year. So that clearly was representative or prophetic of Jesus, who is our high priest. And he was a perfect sacrifice that brings true redemption and true justification something that the law was unable to do. It, we had to have uh, Jesus. And again, I want to go back to that scripture, Hebrews 9.24. It says, for Christ has entered not, not into holy places made with hands, okay? Not into the tabernacle, literally, that was made with hands. It says Christ has entered into holy places made, not, not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. So this is just incredible how it, it was all prophetic of pointing to Jesus, that he would rip that veil. He would be that high priest that would go in and, and make that sacrifice that would truly redeem and truly justify. And we've been living under that fullness of gospel since the cross. And it's what a blessing it's been and what a blessing it is to be alive in that period of time when we have the fullness, the full light of the gospel revealed to us. It's unbelievable. And I, I just think there seems to be quite a lot of biblical typology that presents evidence that after two days or 2,000 years, uh, since the cross, since Jesus has been away, you know, going back to that, that three day pattern of one day gone, two day gone, three day returned. Um, that after this two days of Jesus being gone since the cross, that Jesus is going to return. And we know his second coming, his return to earth happens at the end of the tribulation period. And we know before the seven-year tribulation period comes the rapture. I'll bring up this, this other chart again. So if, if we know these things from Scripture, if his second coming is at the end of the tribulation period, and it's reasonable to assume that that is possibly going to happen somewhere around 2030 to 2033, somewhere around there, then we look at seven years prior to the tribulation period, and that leads us to look at 2023 through 2026 for a possible high watch window for the rapture. I mean, this is incredible times to be alive. And, you know, again, I lean towards, I think that there's a lot of things that make sense about 30 AD being the date of the cross. So that means... I'm very excited about this year. And if it doesn't happen this year, I'm not going to be crushed. We don't set our hope in a date, guys. 
We set our hope in Jesus Christ, and he will, will fulfill his word. But on the same token, you know, we're not date setters. We're not going to set our hope in a date. But at the same, on the other side of the same coin, you can't be like, well, there's no way to know. And we could be 100 years away or we could be 20 years away. There's enough here that you, you should discern the times. And that's how I feel anyway. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And, and I was just chuckling at what Lisa Elder wrote. She's like, release the rapture. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> they can release the Kraken. Uh, but hey, here's something I just I just saw this right now. And, and I want to ask a question to the, everybody out in the chat real quick. And I'll give it a, a second or two or a few seconds. What was the worst, most tragic um, uh, atrocity or catastrophe that has happened to the Jewish people? In the last 2,000 years. In the last 2,000 years. Yeah, so, so since... Uh, since the cross. Um, yes, from, from 70, let's just say from 70 AD, from the destruction of Jerusalem till today. What was the worst... People are saying Holocaust. The most catastrophic. People are in saying terms Holocaust. Of number of, yeah, okay. The, the Holocaust, right? The Jewish Holocaust... Under the under the guy under the um, the command of the, the the Nazi Third Reich, who killed six million Jews in the most horrific possible ways, in the most uh, dehumanizing ways, uh, you just I, you know when I think back to watching like Schindler, uh, Schindler's List, um, you know I just it, it chokes me up thinking about having to move out of your house. Leave everything behind. They throw you in a ghetto. And then they say after a while, hey, let's take put you on a train and we're going to take you to another place. And don't worry about your luggage. You'll, it'll get there when you get there. It'll meet you there. And knowing these people are going to their deaths, right? The most horrific time was the Jewish Holocaust. So let me go back and read this from last the last time we did this final four from Hosea. I'm going to start in verse 515. Mm. God begins saying, I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense. Then they will seek my face in their affliction. They will earnestly seek me. Folks, I don't know what could be more horrific in, in this affliction than, it, than the Holocaust. And we've seen out of the result of the Holocaust that the Jews sealed in their minds this idea of never again. And they fought to get their own nation. They got their own nation. And and now we're seeing this culminating even further to the point that they want their temple now. And I think we're coming up to that point where they believe that they live in the age of the Messiah. And I know they don't recognize Jesus as the Messiah, but they believe that they're living in this messianic age right now. And they need their temple. And they are very... Um, and that's why we're seeing all the turmoil right now in Israel, because I think Satan is fighting against that and he's stirring up the masses um, so that they that they can't do this. But I think as God always does, uh, his agenda and his plan is going to prevail. And these people are going to be able to get either uh, the temple started or in the process. And it seems to coincide right with around the time of the rapture of the church. Because then it says, come and let us return to the Lord. Now, this is in the Old Testament, right? So they're still thinking, you know, Yahweh, uh, the, the Jehovah God, that this is who they are going to return to. And they are very fixated on getting this temple rebuilt. For he has torn, but he will heal us. He was stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will raise us up. And that's true. That will happen. Because we're at, coming at the end of the second day. And so I was just thinking back and I saw that word affliction and it just really popped to me that that the worst point in, in Jewish history is the Holocaust. Far greater than, than what happened in 70 AD in terms of the number of Jews killed. Um, more devastating than all the pogroms they've been through and the, the expulsions from various European countries and places. I mean... The Nazi Holocaust was the definitive 
low point in the Jewish history in terms of the things that they could have under undergone. I mean, had they won the world, the second world war, I mean, the Jewish people would be very close to extinction at this point, if not already extinct, you know, if, if things had not turned out the way that they did. But so read that, read that verse one more time about, um, I will return to my place. Read that one more time. It says, I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense. So what was their offense? Of not believing in him, not trusting in him. Yeah. In, in Matthew 27, remember when, when Jesus was, they had Jesus up there with Barabbas and Pontius Pilate was letting them choose. And they said they kept chanting Barabbas, Barabbas, Barabbas. And they said, let his blood be upon us. And talking about Jesus, you know, because they're chanting, crucify him, crucify him. And he said, and there's and the crowd is saying, let his blood be upon us and our children. That that, in my opinion, is what that offense is. Then they will seek my face in their affliction. They will earnestly seek me. And I think that that affliction culminated with the, the Third Reich and the Holocaust. Well, I was actually going to bring a point up there. I, I think. uh my perspective on that is that that affliction is the tribulation period because the Holocaust was terrible, but what's coming in the tribulation is actually going to be worse than the Holocaust. The Bible says it will be a time such as never been before, no, nor shall ever be. And we know that it's the, according to Jeremiah chapter 30, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. And it says, but he shall be saved out of it. And I think it's, it's very clearly God's plan that the tribulation period, which brings affliction to Jacob, to Israel, uh, God will refine Israel and they will be brought down to a one third remnant and preserved uh, supernaturally through the tribulation period. And Jesus said to them, you know, you will not see me again until you see say Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know, Baruch Habab, Hashem Adonai. So he says, I'll return to my place there in Hosea. He says, I will return to my place. And, and, and in their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. And I think that's, that's what it's talking about is Jesus has returned to his place. He's Since the cross, it's been about 2,000 years. And, it, and in their affliction, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, tribulation period, because in the Holocaust, they, Israel didn't seek Jesus. They were still in blindness at that point. Uh, but in the, holo, in, the, sorry, in the tribulation, they're going to finally say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're going to call out to Jesus as their Messiah. And, and that's when you know, that third day comes and, and the day of rest. Yeah, I... I... I wanted to add to this that that in my uh, before I went on vacation, I had this uh, my top three and I talked about the parallels that this is a parallel that they have. There is a parallel of their this affliction that is going to come to its culmination within the 70th week itself. Mm. Just like you said, I think it's in Zechariah that says um, that, they, that they will be refined as through fire and like two thirds will be burned up and then one third will make it through the fire. Um, but yeah, so the, the, definitely that the tribulation will be the point that they finally cry out to God, um, and recognize that Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah. But we see that we see this parallel, I think, show back with Ezekiel 30, um, 37 in the Valley of Dry Bones, where they're brought back as a nation, but they're brought back in unbelief. But, you know, even today, even today, something is stirring mm. uh, in the Jewish nation that, that this um, messianic uh, fe fever they've got going on. And I think they're ready. They are ready for this, uh, the Messiah to come. And I think that they feel like this is the time and that they're drawing close to it. So and, and one other thing I wanted to, uh, to, to kind of bring up, and I, I don't know, I saw Carol Vey ask this about an hour or two ago, um, this idea of the calendar. Um, so right now we are under the Gregorian calendar and we 
reckon time, you know, at 365 days a year when 0.24 or whatever it is. Um, but we know that inside of the 70th week that, that God is going to or, ordain things according to these 30 day months, right? Because you have the 1260 days and, right. and everything. So it ends up being 30 day months. So for the times time ha and half a time for the last portion of it. Um, so I don't know how that, I was going to get your opinion on this because I don't know how that, how, how the world is going to make that transition. Is the world going to continue on operating under this present, you know, Gentile calendar that we're under while on top of that, God is going to be doing everything he's doing according to his, the, the Hebrew calendar, the prophetic calendar. Like, how do you think that that's going to play out? Because obviously Satan is going to be aware of, um, God's, God's going to say, Hey, there's seven years from this point to this point, And this is how I'm going to break it down. And Satan in the world right now, we're all operating under this Gentile calendar. Um, so I don't know. I didn't know if you ever, ever thought about that before. And that Carol's question sparked the idea. I think, um, there's several different opinions and different ways to look at it. I mean, I know that it's the, the Bible talks about the heavens being shaken, the powers of the heavens being shaken. So it's quite possible that, uh, you know, the, the Bible talks about the sun getting hotter, uh, there being darkness for, a, you know, a period of the day, things like that. So it's quite possible that there could literally be something astronomical uh, that changes uh, something massive that where the length of a year or, you know, the, the, time of day, how many hours, things like that changes and, and things could literally go to a 360 day year or 30 day months. Um, or it also, another way to look at it would be, uh, the world stays on this 365 day calendar, but who cares what the world's doing? God's plan is above all. So the way he's looking at it is very clearly he, you know, he's, already declared that the tribulation period will be uh, split up into tw two 1260 day periods. And, and he calls that seven years. And so, you know, I don't think it's, it is interesting, but it's not, it's not something to really get hung up on. Cause I, I know some people do, uh, it's not something like we, we got to figure out or else it, it's just an interesting thing. Um, but I do want to point out something, and I'm going to be doing a video on this soon. I know I told you, but just as we've been showing you guys here that biblical typology shows truth of a pre-tribulation rapture, of a seven-day plan, of a, a three three days since the cross, you know, two gone, one returned. There's all these biblical typologies that show what's coming. Uh, biblical typology also very clearly shows a seven year tribulation period. There will be a, a final week, Daniel's 70th week. Uh, it is not only three and a half years that's coming up. There's a lot of people that are getting caught up in that confusion right now. Um, a lot of pre wrath kind of teaching going along around right now. Uh, when it, when the Bible says that there will be no flesh left alive unless God has shortened those days, what it's saying is God has determined it will only be seven years and no longer. He's already determined that. And if it had gone, if it were to go longer than that, there wouldn't be any flesh alive. He's shortened it to only allow it, only allow Satan and the Antichrist seven years. It's his plan. And so, there, there is not, listen, it's a, it's not true. These, these type of teachings that are going around saying, oh, well, the first three and a half years was Jesus ministry and there's only three and a half years to come. So you're actually going to see the first half of the tribulation. And that's all confusion and very poor doctrine and not sound biblical teaching. Biblical typology shows a seven year tribulation. There is a Daniel's 70th week, the time of Jacob's trouble. It's a seven year period coming. 
And we, the church, will not be here for any of it. Um, but as to how God reckons time, whether the world gets on a different calendar or not, very interesting. We'll see. But I don't, I don't really claim to know. Well, thanks for everybody for hanging in with us. I think we're at. Uh, yeah, we made it. Is that right? Is that two right? hours and five that minutes? Time? Oh yeah, yeah. two two thousand seventy five people with us right now. Praise God. So that's all I had to share, guys. And Pete, did you have any more? Because I mean, here's the here's the point. Okay, here's the point. We are at a period in time. I'm going to bring this chart up one more time, where you you should be discerning the times. Again, Jesus holds us accountable. He held the Pharisees accountable saying, you should discern the times, you hypocrites. You can tell what the weather's going to do. Barry brought this up. He said, you know, we've got phones now where we can tell the weather by an hourly basis. Like, oh, you know, it's going to rain in the next couple hours and then it's going to stop and three hours after that. It, the same applies to, to the prophetic word. We have, like it says in 2 Peter 1.19, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you would do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Listen, we have so much Bible prophecy, Bible typology. We have so much data to, to now consider and look at, as you see in this possible timeline here in this chart. There's one thing that's clear. Though, though we don't claim to know when the rapture is going to be, what we do uh, say here tonight is that Jesus is coming soon. And we are in this time when you need to discern the times and understand Jesus is coming soon. It could be any time now, any moment now. And it's time to look up. And this should be something that spurs you on to share the gospel, to, to do to be faithful and do whatever it is that God has called you to do. And you do not have to be an evangelist. You don't have to have a channel. You don't have, a, have to have a ministry. You might be a prayer warrior. You might be a giver. You might be a server. You might be someone who supports all these things. God says that if you give a cup of water even to a child in his name, he will see it and reward it. It is time for you to be encouraged and spurred on even more to do that which God has called you to do, that which God has gifted you to do. And if anything, understanding the time that you are in now should make you more excited, more encouraged, and more um, determined to be about the Father's business. That's our point tonight. And, and I want to... We can't get away without, you know, sharing the gospel. This is the whole point. It's all about Jesus. This is, if you don't have Jesus, you need Jesus. Because what's coming is the tribulation period after the rapture. You don't want to be here for that. Not only that, you could die at any moment. You could choke on a piece of broccoli tonight. Okay. The Bible says, Romans 10, 9 through 10, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And here's the good news. It's, we've been going over it this whole time in this, in this video, uh, the typology. But it's the, this fact from 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4, that... Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And there's one thing that will decide everything. There's one thing that will either condemn you and send you off to a place of your choosing, which is hell and separation from God and eternal torment, or you can choose eternal life. An eternal blessing. It's one thing. And it says in John 3, verse 18, it says, whoever believes in him, Jesus, is not condemned. But whoever does not believe 
is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. That's the thing. That's the choice you have to make. And so what we're talking about tonight should encourage you to share that message or to take that message to heart. And Pete, I'll, I'll let you give the last word and wrap it up tonight. Well, thanks for having me on, Tyler. It's been a real uh, blessing to be back on here with you. It was good to hang out with you a little bit over my vacation and uh, show you a little bit of my world. And, uh, you know, I just you talking there, it just spurred to mind something. Um, Hebrews 10, 24 uh, through 25. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another in so much the more as you see the day approaching. Folks, we are seeing the day approaching and Tyler, myself, Barry, Chad, Chooch and, and countless others even amongst ourselves in, in, in being here, this online community, we are assembling together and we are spurring each other in love to do good works as we see this day approaching. We are seeing this day approaching quickly and it's coming. We don't know exactly when it's going to come, but we feel it and we can see everything, all the evidence being laid out in front of us. Um, so I just want to say, um, folks, as things continue to get closer to the end things are going to continue to unravel and unwind and become uh, more disjointed and the world's going to get a little crazier and a little crazier each and every day just you know lean into the storm and uh, and uh, keep your eyes fixed on on christ the author and finisher of our faith and i just before we go uh let's i want to close out in a prayer i want to i want to pray for those I've seen it in the chat and I didn't even realize what was going on tonight, but um, you can see oh. all of the storms and tornadoes that are, that are stretched from Louisiana all the way up to, uh, you know, Illinois and, and Michigan, mm -hmm. it looks like. So uh, if you want, we can close out a, a prayer, Tyler. Absolutely. I'll close this out. Go ahead. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you and we are so blessed and thankful for your word that you shared with us things before they would come to pass, Lord, so that we would uh, take comfort and hope in a world that's quickly falling apart. Lord, we love you. We thank you for sending your son to die for our sins on the cross, Lord, because without him, we would have no hope at all. And Lord, we know and we thank you for the rapture. It, the rapture is not something that is disconnected from Christ. It is Christ. It is Christ's return for his bride, the church, Lord. And this is what we look forward to and long to, to be with you. Lord, and I know that you long to be with us as well. I pray, Father, that each person here tonight or listening after would be emboldened to share the gospel in their small circles or big circles or whatever circles of influence that they have, Lord, just that they would get busy about your work if they're not already. We pray for, Father, those that are um, in our families that don't know or don't believe, Lord, we pray that you would just uh, soften their hearts and draw them to you, Lord. We pray for those in our audience that are um, suffering through health issues. Pray for comfort and and um, and healing, Father. We pray for those that are struggling financially, or struggling with their marriage, or struggling with any other number of issues, Father. I pray that you would, and you know, you know their situations, Lord. I pray that you would be with them and guide them and direct them in those things, Lord. We just lift all these things up to you in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And Lord, we, we also want to pray uh, for everyone who's in the path of these storms and in, and in the storms right now, Lord, that you would just, your, your hand of protection would be upon them, that you would protect them from the storm, that you would preserve their life, preserve their property. Lord, we just ask that you would be with them, um, comfort them, give them peace, watch over them, Lord. And um, Lord, we just, we just pray that you would be with uh, everyone, while this is going on, keep them safe, God, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Pete, thank you for being here with us, man. Yeah, it was awesome. And don't uh, don't eat any broccoli tonight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, guys, listen, um, 
We love you guys. Uh, until we see you next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And I um, hope you have a good night.